Welcome. It's Wednesday, February 22nd, 2012. I'm Aaron Dykes, and we are in an aggressive but entirely nonviolent information war. They are taking over our Constitution, hijacking the fact that we are endowed by the Creator with inalienable rights, and we better take it back. This fascism has been creeping and creeping and creeping for decades. That's gone. It's happening now. Everything is coming undone, and the fight is on right now for our rights on every front imaginable. Coming up on one of those fronts, we have Sheriff Richard Mack. He's been doing constitutional conventions with sheriffs to try to take back our states and local counties from all this federal encroachment. That's coming up. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. But first, the news. Ron Paul is being cheated out of the Republican nomination, and don't be surprised out there. You've seen all the fudging on the media where they forget to even put his name in polls, where he comes in first or second place in a straw poll and they don't even report. They report on the third or fourth place people. All these other shark teeth, phony rhino candidates have fallen out of the race, and they still prop up Romney and Gingrich and Santorum. It still doesn't stop Ron Paul even as they've been cheating him in primary and caucus state after caucus state after caucus state. We've got a video in just a moment with Alex on the issue in depth. But of course, they've had to admit in Maine they didn't count on the votes. They accidentally reported that they weren't going to count the votes in certain counties that would have swung towards Ron Paul. And most significantly, they put off a heavily pro-Ron Paul county and district for over a week due to snow that never came also, they can announce Mitt Romney as the winner. It happened in Iowa, too. They admitted they didn't have a real vote count, but they just agreed. The Republican Party agreed behind closed doors to announce uh, Romney, then later Santorum, as the victor, uh, giving them a too close for statistical tie uh, count, only a few votes apart somehow. And Ron Paul magically, forgettably in third place, even though he had nearly as many votes as well. And most suspiciously of all, Nevada, a heavily libertarian state, a leave me alone and get out of my life state uh, that Ron Paul did very well in and came in second place in 2008. Uh, yet in 2012, Ron Paul got barely any more votes and uh, was nowhere to be seen as R Mitt Romney somehow quote unquote swept it. No, these are all signs of fraud. It's been taken from Ron Paul. The system is scared. And uh, but he's not out of the race yet. Things can still happen. Anyway, let's go to Alex Jones now and see his in-depth coverage on this issue. There's no doubt that there's election fraud going on in this country. There's been countless examples of it going back to Kennedy in 1960 and the fraud up in Illinois. We know about LBJ in Texas to get into Congress and fraud. We know about what happened in the 2000 election. It's been certified in Ohio that it was fraud in 2004. But now with Ron Paul, it is undoubted. He clearly won in Iowa. And a month after that election, they just threw the whole thing out and haven't said what they're going to do now, but admitted that a bunch of the precincts had their records disappear. Everywhere like Ames, where he was showing 55, 60% in the polls, all those college university areas. Then we saw the incredible fraud that took place uh, in Nevada, uh, where Ron Paul in most polls was number one, but came out number three. And then, of course, we saw what happened in Maine. There's many other examples, but in Maine, he was polling number one in almost every poll, some polls number two. And then he came out, of course, uh, losing in Maine. And now he's challenged it, and so they're having to go back and say, oh, we did say that Romney had won with only a few percentage points in. And oh, a whole bunch of counties, the counties that were college areas and others that were polling the highest, they just didn't get counted that night. That's exactly what happened in Iowa, exactly what happened in Nevada. It's exactly what's happening all over this country. And finally, Ron Paul is challenging it. Listen, Stalin said, I don't care who votes. I care who counts the votes. We have a government that lied about WMDs, a government caught stealing and lying constantly. We'd be idiots to believe no liars who've been caught engaged in fraud. We've had diebold programmers come out and say it's a scam. We've, we've seen so much evidence of this. But the reason we got behind Ron Paul was so we could put out the message of liberty and freedom and ending the private Federal Reserve and stopping this empire that we pay for. So he's won by running and he's winning by illustrating how much fraud there is. But let me get into more evidence of the fact that Ron Paul is really number one. First off, they told us he couldn't win. They told us he was going to lose. They told us that uh, it would throw away our vote if we supported him and he wasn't even the running. And still, he won all the straw polls. Still, he got the most 
overall donations from small independent donors showing true grassroots support. And despite that controlled corporate media uh, mantra that he couldn't win, that worked four years ago, it failed, and he was still in that top tier. But here's the biggest piece of evidence of fraud. Not just the fact that he was given the least amount of time in the debates, 89 seconds of the CBS, so that when he does get coverage, it's incredibly negative. No. It's that consistently in the last year, he's gotten more money, even though there were eight Republican candidates early on, and it still shows the numbers today with only four left. Ron Paul, in the last year, has gotten over 70% of all total donations from the military for all Republicans and Obama. And that's the big secret they don't want you to know about. Now, what does that illustrate? That where it's a straw poll or where it's a scientific poll or where it's flat out donations, he's winning in every indicator that they haven't been able to game or corrupt yet. They can only game their electronic voting machines or in the case of Iowa or other areas, he even wins the precincts, but then they don't report them in and say the truck got lost. There were no trucks in Iowa. They vote right there. They post the results, call it in. But they said a bunch of trucks got lost everywhere he was winning by double digits. Same thing now happened in Maine. So he's winning. And that last piece of evidence, getting all those military donations, people like Adam Kokesh and other veterans had a march. Thousands and thousands showed up of active duty. Almost no corporate or media coverage. Again, showing they'll game things, showing they'll cover things up. In the debates, they attack him and say, you don't support the wars. You don't support the military, implying the military supports all these illegal wars, when in all the polls show they don't. Imagine if another candidate who was a warmonger had this type of military support. That's all you'd hear about. So it shows that the military is waking up, so are the police. They understand that criminals have taken over our government. And so it's a process. Even if Ron Paul doesn't win because of fraud, he is America's real president. And it shows that the ideas of sovereignty and anti-globalism and true freedom worldwide, 1776 worldwide is the answer. Now, I'm on the road traveling to Orlando to speak this next Sunday. I'll be doing reports for the nightly news. I'll be doing my radio show live from the road every day at 11 a.m. Central, 12 noon Eastern. But we, when I get back, I'm going to compile a huge report with all the evidence of fraud, uh, with all the graphs and numbers to show this to you and break it down. But you've all seen it for yourself. But get the word out. We know that there's massive election fraud. We know the black boxes are kicking in. We know the scams are taking place. And our entire process of being a constitutional republic and the people being able to vote uh, is in deep trouble. But look, Congress has a 9% approval rating for two years running now, lowest in history. And it's only going to get lower. Of course it's fraud. Most people are awake and angry, but still, the corporate welfare, the wars, the corruption, the gun grabbing, the fast and furious, all of it, the so socialist health care, it only gets worse regardless of what we do because the fix is in in many areas. They don't have these machines in everywhere. And where they don't, they just don't count the caucus votes. Uh, they've got their people in everywhere, and everywhere libertarians and constitutionalists try to run locally, the Fed's minions are there trying to block them. But more and more, they're failing, in the case of Rand Paul and others. That's why you've got to run for local office. You've got to be a watchdog. You've got to take over the bureaucracy yourself so that more and more we can expose what they're doing. So look how far we've grown. Ron Paul, 10 years ago, couldn't get one co-sponsored off the Fed. Passed the House last year, killed in the Senate. He's almost got the votes again this year. The idea is out. The liberty is there. That's why top globalist Brzezinski says the elite has never been in this much trouble. All right, I'm Alex Jones reporting for InfoWars.com. Please get this video out to everybody because knowing is half the battle. Being aware of what they're doing is half the battle and getting out of our denial and saying no and waking up. Here's the evidence. You've seen it. Now the rest is up to you. Get out there and expose what's happening. And of course, we all know why they would cheat Ron Paul out of the nomination, the constitutional congressman, who they said is on a quixotic bid, who couldn't win. And even as he wins, uh, they just keep turning the cameras away, ignoring him, looking to all other issues. It's because he deals with things like the Federal Reserve. And so what is up with the Federal Reserve lately as they approach the end of their 100-year charter as somehow they're going to sell us on 100 more years of their pure tyranny? Well, the Fed is writing sweeping rules from behind closed doors. That is a headline in the Wall Street Journal. And they report that the Federal Reserve has operated almost entirely behind closed doors as it rewrites the rule book governing the U.S. financial system they're calling it the most dramatic revision since the Great Depression, and it's been almost completely without public meetings. Since the Dodd-Frank financial overhaul became law in July 2010,
The Fed has had 47 separate votes on financial regulation and scores more to come. And 45 of those 47 votes were totally behind closed doors. They secretly emailed in the votes later and even failed to report uh, the few people within the Fed system who dissented on their decisions. That's the kind of things happening. They have so-called sunshine laws, but apparently that's just been interpreted as opening the window as they meet behind doors in the smoky room. Someone really had better shine a gigantic light on the Fed. Look what came out from the partial audit that they finally got after decades of, of hammering home this issue after Ron Paul bought his entire career in Congress to try to bring this up to audit the Fed fully. They found that they were lending to all the familiar big banks. And so what are the decisions they're making behind closed doors in these 47 uh, mostly secret meetings. Well, the meeting on how much capital a bank must hold, what kind of trading banks can engage in, what kind of fees banks can charge on debit card transactions, all the kind of crazy stuff. And they've got a chart here on the Volcker rule, which is a really dumbed down version under the Dodd-Frank bill, which was made to appear as though they're reigning in the banks when really they're not. Uh, a, a dumbed down version of Glass-Steagall. Uh, Glass-Steagall, of course, the rule that prevented banks uh, that held just general regular money from speculating and investing and going crazy on that derivatives market. The other set of meetings were all on derivatives. And who had the most meetings in both cases? It was JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, and Goldman Sachs, of course, up there as well, along with the other familiars, Barclays and Morgan Stanley. Why JP Morgan Chase at 16 meetings for the Volcker Rule? Why JP Morgan Chase at 14 meetings for the Volcker Rule? Well, you guessed it, because Jamie Dimon is the number one person on the Federal Reserve Board of Directors, and he's the current CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, the Rockefeller and Rothschild-owned bank. That's right, J.P. Morgan was just a front man for the Rothschilds. The Rockefellers merged their Chase banking operations some years ago into that super mega bank, which has more than $90 trillion in derivatives, and that's a huge, huge issue. Of course, they're meeting on it. So Jamie Dimon is on the board of the Federal Reserve. Uh, we've got it right here. In fact, the board has three classes. He's a Class A member. Other vultures in that class of board of directors include Richard L. Carrion. No, I'm not making up the name. He's Carrion Eater, a little vulture. And then they have people represented to uh, represent the public elected and appointed to represent the public. People like the chairman of Macy's and other big institutions, Silver Lake, the big tech institution. Uh, so why was JP Morgan Chase at all these meetings? Because anytime Jamie Dimon shows up, he represents both of them. They meet in private. The Rothschilds and Rocket Rockefellers set up the Federal Reserve and they have controlling shares in it, along with other big bankers. How disgusting is that? And how important is it that we bring uh, true accountability to the Fed and move to shut it down. Just another reason to support Ron Paul because no one else is even close on that issue. Not even close. Meanwhile, uh, following popular outrage over SOPA and PIPA and ACTA and other attempts to strong arm, control the internet, chill free speech, and shut down websites on a whim, now the globalists are pushing an internet control freak treaty through the United Nations. That's a report by Kurt Nimmo. Uh, the International Telecommunication Union, uh, abbreviated to ITU, is a treaty-based organization under the auspices of the United Nations. The ITU is working to globalize the radio spectrum, the latest generation wireless devices, aeronautical maritime navigation, radio astronomy, satellite-based meteorology, along with the Internet, the big one. It is positioning itself to control the next generation networks, the technology that will replace the current free and open internet. Of course, it is a longstanding plan. You've heard Alex talk about it many times over many years, and uh, here it comes. In addition to imposing cybersecurity mandates, it will also outlaw peer-to-peer -peer technologies. And who meets at the Bilderberg meeting for the past several years? None other than the head of cybersecurity, the co-current head of the NSA, General Keith Alexander. He met with all the big tech heads, all the digital uh, agenda people from the EU, the counterparts in the United States, the anti-monopoly, antitrust people. All those people met at Bilderberg and just so happened to be the year we saw SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, and now this disgusting United Nations Treaty. Just something else to keep an eye on because they're trying to crack down on the web one way or another. Hmm.
Meanwhile, counterterrorism and northern border drug strategy is tied to perimeter security deal. That's from Dana Gabrielle, uh, really one of the only people still writing about the North American Union. Uh, we exposed this issue years ago. People were up in arms about it as they tried to put in the super NAFTA highways and all the rest of it, merging our countries between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Uh, but what's happened now in the years since that's been exposed? Well, we've seen the Fast and Furious thing attempting to bring greater coordination in between the U.S. and Mexico. Meanwhile, they just passed the Beyond Borders deal under the North American Union agenda between Canada and the United States. The whole thing is outlined to control drugs. And you've got people like Senator Chuck Schumer saying, I can't wait till we stop the flow of drugs on the northern border because it all comes in to New York. They're not going to stop any drugs. It's just another excuse, just like with Fast and Furious, all of it. They guard the opium fields, they ship in the cocaine, they protect the cartels, all of it. This is just a pretext for greater control. The Beyond Borders Pact outlines and allows U.S. Uh, officials to be on the Canadian side of the border, allows Canadian officials to be on the U.S. side of the border, allows so-called security personnel like the TSA and the air marshals to operate across the border and for the Canadian Mounties to operate on our side of the border. And, of course, it's got the giant database where they share all the traveler data, uh, all the traveler's information from Canada with the U.S., it's all in that centralized database, just further integrating our country. More great reporting from Dana Gabrielle. And you should check out the issue, too. You'll be amazed at the stuff you find. Mike Adams has a new story how pasteurized milk is 150 times more contaminated with blood, pus, and feces than fresh milk. And that's right, they do have all those things in that so-called pasteurized milk that you get from stores. Uh, this is a response, actually, to the CDC putting out the stunning propaganda claim that raw dairy milk is, quote, 150 times more dangerous than pasteurized milk. Yeah. Yeah, right. Actually, it has almost all the essential amino acids. It's got unbroken protein chains, incredibly good for the body, as long as the farm is clean. And most of those farms who still do raw milk, although they're afraid of being shut down by these terrible federal regulators, uh, actually keep very clean farms. The whole thing with pasteurization is to allow, as Mike Adams puts, points out in the article, to allow dirty dairy uh, to do what they want, to allow this blood, pus, all this dirt, all this disgusting stuff, even feces, to be in your milk. Then they just heat it up, destroy all the nutritional proteins in there, and uh, so-called kill the dangerous things that might be in the milk. And that's what they push on the public as they arrest Amish people and more. In completely different news, Strauss Kahn, the former head of the IMF, was arrested by French police for, quote, complicity in pimping after he admits to attending sex parties all over the world. Uh, yes, it is a story basically out of eyes wide shut. Great graphic we got there from the crew. Uh, the disgraced former head of the uh, International Monetary Fund who lost his job amid claims he tried to rape a New York chambermaid could face jail time over the, quote, sex parties he's admitted to attending around the world. Strauss Kahn, 62, whose wife, Anne Sinclair, is standing by him has made the extraordinary claim he was unaware the women at the orgies were prostitutes because, quote, they were naked at the time. Look, actually, I don't care what DSK does in his private life. Obviously, I'm against raping anyone, including uh, maids, uh, even, those, uh, even though those allegations were dropped. What I'm really against is the heads of the IMF raping entire nations, because that's what they do. Unfortunately, uh, when DSK was driven out of office and made into a celebrity scandal, he was replaced by someone at least as wicked, Christine Lagarde. Uh, meanwhile, at the World Bank, the sister twin organization, you got a toss-up between Larry Summers, who wants to pollute the third world as he rapes us economically here at home, or you've got Hillary Clinton, who pushes vaccines and, and population control in the third world, Hillary Clinton, who was on the board of Walmart, Hillary Clinton, who uh, was in the legal representation for Monsanto. Those are our leaders. That's the real raping going on. Forget about these little scandals. And sure, they do terrible things in their personal lives. Whatever. Other nice news here. A U.S. government program secretly injected people with plutonium as well as uranium, the article goes on to discuss. Uh, this came out earlier in February. There's fresh reporting on it today. You've also got Anthony uh, Giuciardi, 
She really learned to speak Italian. It's been revealed the U.S. government program secretly injected citizens with plutonium and uranium. They took unwitting subjects in the 1940s, uh, injected them with uranium to test the effects, all while telling them they were being treated uh, for other kinds of things. Uh, in one particular case, the first man injected was Eb Cade in early 1945. He was a worker at the Oak Ridge nuclear facility. He later got in a car wreck. He survived and was bedbound with a broken arm and leg. Doctors interviewed him, gave him reassurances, told him how nice everything would be, uh, then ascertained that the 53-year-old, oh, African-American man, I guess he's disposable and, and disenfranchised and on the fringes, so no one will pay attention if we inject uranium in him. Uh, they found he was otherwise healthy, eating well, drinking well, had no other serious illnesses, so they realized they had a healthy subject and, and juiced him up with 4.7 micrograms of plutonium. Isn't that nice? It's not clear who ordered the injection, but it's clear it wasn't for the health. The article quips. Uh, they continued to experiment on him. They pulled 15 teeth. They tested his bone tissue. Never told him what was going on, although he had some idea because according to the reports, he escaped from the uh, hospital one night. Uh, anyway, he died later, like less than 10 years later, uh, when he was still a, quote, healthy man. They tested plenty of other people. They eventually investigated this in 1974. Uh, but this was done first through the Manhattan Project secretly, then later somewhat less secretly through the Atomic Energy Commission, all to find out what the uh, effects would be. They write here in the article, in April of 1947, possibly in response to the Nuremberg trials concerning human experimentation, it was recommended patients be told they'd be injected with, quote, a new substance that, quote, no one knew what it did, but that it would inhibit cancer growth. No one knew what uranium and plutonium would do. Here you go. And the article goes on. They tested lots of other people, never told them, lied to them. They all found out decades later, if at all. Just disgusting. So just remember, your government's out for your own good. They know what's best for your safety. As we turn to the next issue, TSA questioning body scanner opt-outs. Steve Watson writes at Infowars.com, refusing to be irradiated, now treated as suspicious behavior. And of course, they've already deployed the, quote, behavior detection officers to watch for nervousness or people who don't like going through security because that's suspicious terrorist activity. Instances of TSA agents demanding to know why travelers are opting out of walking through X-ray firing body scanners and treating the action as suspicious continue to be reported. Here's an account in LewRockwell.com, who's also a great defender of civil liberties and has also been covering the TSA issue for many years. They've got an account from traveler Ryan Alford, uh, who writes how he was asked by an agent, why did you opt out? To which he replied, am I required to answer? The agent mumbled and continued groping and poking, then asked, why are you traveling to? He again answered, Am I required to answer? And then, of course, they brought over the supervisors and asked him more uh, questions and then finally let him go. And that's just what you can expect because they planned all along to make everyone go through the body scanners and to refuse the ability to travel to anyone who didn't submit to the body scanner or to the new trusted traveler program, which is guaranteed not to stop any terrorism. Of course, that's already a guarantee of the TSA. They didn't stop the underwear bomber. They've never stopped or caught any terrorist whatsoever. At the very best, they've showed us some probably cooked up images of the 9-11 hijackers well after the fact. Now, of course, they were planning the body scanners well before the underwear bomber incident. I myself uh, was encouraged to go through one before the body scanner thing happened after uh, Abdul Matalab, who's now pleaded guilty, is now back in the news to help legitimize the body scanners. And you know what happened when I told them, no, I'm not going through the body scanner. I don't want to be radiated. Well, before I got the pat down, I was told, you read too much. Now they've got the so-called law in Australia, which I'm sure is going to be a model law for the whole world. No scan, no fly, reports the Digital Journal, as Australian airports roll out full body scans. They're telling everyone you will go through the body scanners or you won't fly. And that's really a shame. I really wanted to visit Australia someday. So many interesting landmarks and culture there. But with this so-called law in place, I will never be visiting them. Uh, and what's more dangerous anyway, these body scanners that they said wouldn't store images, they said 
They couldn't look at you. They said perverts wouldn't be looking at it and uh, pulling out, quote, cute looking women with, quote, good figures to go through the body scanners again. Well, it turns out they had a study in 1998. Yes, 1998, before the 2001 9-11 hijacking incident, the 9-11 attacks, the the big event for this whole new society. 1998, government ignored report finding up to 100 cancer deaths from TSA naked body scanners per year. 100 deaths a year statistically from the radiation scanners because it's just like stuff you dose in the water, whether it's fluoride or whether it's these crazy proposals for lithium. Even a depressed person has to have a very uh, metered out, very careful uh, dosage based on their body weight, on their other conditions, other factors. You can't mass dose people. You got people already at risk, and when they're forced through these body scanners, it triggers something. People get cancer. It's statistically known that if you put everyone through these, uh, all the travelers through these body scanners, you're going to get statistically 100 deaths a year. They knew that in 1998. They've had the other John Hopkins studies and everything else showing how dangerous this stuff is. And the TSA, Homeland Security, keeps lying about it. They keep obfuscating. They keep waffling back and forth. No, it's here. It causes deaths that's less than terrorism causes, if, if, if you even believe in that stuff. The body scanners are more dangerous than the terrorists you claim you're going to catch that you don't even catch. Don't try to put me through one. And don't try to stop our travel. We have a right to travel. We have a right to travel. It's constitutional. It's a God-given right. It's a natural right. You can't. Uh, violate our God-given rights. They're unalienable. They're unalienable. They can't be transferred. We have a natural right. And here we go from 2008 and from 2009, how they were planning to put the body scanners in. Again, all before the stupid underwear bomber incident, which we have a witness coming up. We're going to show you even more video. Kurt Haskell and his wife were on the plane with the underwear bomber. They witnessed what a setup it was, how the sharp-dressed man helped get him on the plane. They witnessed how there were the other weird suspects and how the law enforcement didn't want to hear their accounts and, and they didn't want to admit or release the video cameras that there was a sharp-dressed man. Then later, the State Department, uh, that guy under Secretary Kennedy, had to admit, yeah, he was given the w visa wa waiver, excuse me, the visa waiver, even though he didn't have his ID, even though he didn't uh, even appear to be coherent at the time. A lot of people said he looked drugged up and was let on the plane. Well, none of that matters because everyone who wants to travel will go through the body scanners just as they plan, just as they plan. TSA whole body scanners to replace metal detectors. Uh, that is in April 7, 2009. In a change of plans, the TSA says it will now replace the walkthrough metal detectors at airport checkpoints with whole body imaging machines. They're already at six airports nationwide. The TSA's plans aren't set in stone, they say, but unless there's an uproar, everyone gets to go through them. Why? Because Michael Shertoff, former head of Homeland Security, has an investment in the body scanner machines and has a lobby for them. And what better lobby than to be in the position to create a hoax, a pretext for putting everyone through the machines and selling them to airports? Great scam. No one seems to be able to figure it out, except our brilliant listeners here. I know you know, but... Go tell other people, please. Just disgusting. I give you now part two of the exclusive InfoWars interview with Kurt Haskell. Ah, I really wish he would have filed that lawsuit, though. That's so disappointing. We really have to hold these people accountable as much as we can. This whole thing is such a hoax. They're trying to shut down our travel. I'm going to stop ranting now. Uh, I give you part two of that interview. This part is about how it's a government cover-up and a false flag. Continuing now with our breaking news coverage, new facts on the table tonight about just how hard the father of the alleged Christmas bomber tried to warn U.S. intelligence about his son. One thing I'd like to point out is, is that the system worked. And we're learning tonight more about the suspect. Let's get to Fox News' Andrea Isom. She begins our team coverage. She is live at Metropolitan Airport. Andrea? As the hours go on, you are right. We are learning more about the suspect, and quite frankly, the details are chilling. 
The man, the menace, 23-year-old Abdul Mudala of Nigeria. Mudala's despicable actions were all on Al-Qaeda's behalf. Sources telling Fox News his instructions were to blow up the plane over U.S. soil. The intelligence community knew about Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalib weeks ago and failed to spread word that would have put him on the no-fly list. The father of the suspect in the Christmas incident warned U.S. officials in Africa about his son's extremist views. That a report was prepared and it was sent on to the CIA in Langley, Virginia, CIA headquarters, but it was not disseminated to the wider intelligence community. Obviously, when you have a father coming in, and talking to the embassy about a son who's radicalized, gives the embassy the passport number. The first thing you would think is a, a very fast effort to see if the person's got a visa and suspend the visa. One of the things you don't know about is the number of people that we have turned away because their name has been on the watch list uh, or on the no-fly list. Only my mom could, but not me and my dad, because both me and my dad are, are on the watch list have to believe but eight years later we are still talking about connecting the dots at a failure to communicate call for immediate reviews on how this guy got on the plane and how he was able to get some explosives on the plane so we got a war out of the uh, this is a, uh, a controlled patsy facts are facts you can have your own opinions but you can't have your own facts when we first took off, I noticed about 10 seats ahead of us to the left-hand side. He uh, had a camcorder, and I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe this was his first flight and was just excited. And then when the actual incident occurred, I looked up, and he was the only one standing and filming the entire thing. You know, when we're on the plane, I didn't notice anybody filming. My understanding is that there was someone filming, but my view of his seat was blocked by the restroom. He was on the left side of the plane, I was on the right, and between us there was a restroom, so I wouldn't have been able to see him anyway. Um, my, I know more about the story later on. I initially tried to contact him, the man, shortly after uh, the flight, and I just received an email back from an attorney, you know, and not, and not him. He wouldn't talk to me at all, so that was my initial contact with him. Now, interestingly enough, about six months ago, this man contacted me out of the blue. Um, he was going to have a deposition in regards to the trial where prosecutors, um, FBI agents, and I think some Dutch police or someone, around 10 people were coming to interview him in, in, uh, in Holland, where he lives. Holland, not Michigan, Holland, the country, or uh, the Netherlands, if you will. And... Um, he called me to talk about it. So I actually got to talk to him. He doesn't speak real good English, but we had a conversation for about an hour. And this is what he told me. He said he was traveling by himself. He had just purchased a video camera of some sort, and he was filming us coming in for a landing. Uh, now, mind you, when this started, we were at an altitude of 20,000 feet. Uh, the media reports it was 10,000 feet, but it was 20,000 feet because I, I know I was watching the CBAC monitor when it started. So I'm not sure what exactly you could film that high other than some clouds, but anyway. So he's filming out the window, heard a commotion, he turned and started filming. Um, he said he had video of the incident. He also said he had still pictures of the, uh, the man in orange who was the man taken into custody after we landed. Uh, he told me that the video was seized by the FBI after landing and that he still had the still pictures of the man in orange. So I asked him to forward me copies so I could verify that it was the same man and just for me to look at too. And he asked me why I wanted those and I said for my own personal interest and he said uh, I don't trust that you won't put them on the internet. I'm going to keep them for my own personal safety. Uh, make of that what you will. I don't know. That's his statement. He he didn't seem to be anything other than what he's claiming. From what I could tell, he didn't seem to be lying to me. But you know, make make up your own mind whether you, whether that story is credible or not. The video has never been released. No video of anything in this case has been released to anyone other than the prosecutors, 
the judge and the underwear bomber himself. There is a protective order in the case indicating that any attorney involved in the case cannot speak about what evidence there is. I have a suspicion that Anthony Chambers has some of the videos, maybe not the video on the plane, but I have a strong suspicion that he has the airport security video from Amsterdam. There has never been any picture or video of the underwear bomber released going through security or at the airport or anything. He didn't go through security. He was escorted around security. And actually, the uh, shortly after this incident, there was an article. It's from the Herald Scotland, December 28th, 09. And this is a really important article. And this is the only paper to ever report on this. And nobody talks about it for this one sentence. The mil military police have already said Abdul Mutalab did not go through passport control at Schiphol when he arrived from Lagos. Okay, they admit he didn't go through passport control, but what they don't tell you here is that passport control and security are in the same line at Schiphol. So if you're not going through passport control, you're not going through security. So there's an omission here, Abdul Mutalab not only did not have his passport checked, but he didn't go through security at all. They leave out the fact that he was escorted, but obviously this is the reason no one else is reporting on this article or talking about it, but again, here we have an admission. Uh, the underwear bomber did not go through passport control at Schiphol Airport, and passport control is the same line as security, so therefore uh, 2 plus 2 means he didn't go through security. So he didn't go through security. So there is, therefore, there are no pictures possible of him going through security because he didn't go through it. The FBI contacted uh, Lori and I on December 28, 2009. So three days after this happened, they visited our office here in Detroit, south of Detroit. The first thing I asked them was, hey, you know, I can help you in the investigation. I saw the accomplice at the Amsterdam airport. Wouldn't it be wise to show me uh, the video from the airport or some still pictures so I can identify him? And the two agents, and there are two different agents this time, they kind of did like a half head turn to each other and kind of did like a chuckle under their breath. And that was right at the start of the interview and it raised red flags with me right away. There was no response to you know, we don't have the video at this time, or we don't think you should see it, nothing. No response at all. They then proceeded to ask me the story again, which I told them the story again. They showed me a series of around 10 pictures, and I looked through them. The first eight, I said, I have no idea who these people are. The next two were of the underwear bomber, and I got the impression that they were trying to confuse me to to destroy my credibility maybe? I don't know. It was rather strange, but none of the man in orange and none of uh, the man in tan suit that escorted the bomber at the Amsterdam airport, so it's kind of strange. Pretty early on, within a few days anyway, that there was something really weird going on, maybe a cover-up, because you know I had the FBI agents come to my office on December 28th, not even wanting to talk about the, uh, the man in the tan suit that helped the bomber at Schiphol Airport, which to me was a huge red flag because as far as I know, uh, myself and only one other person saw him, the, other, the one other person hasn't been willing to talk about it. So it would make sense that the government would want to talk to the eyewitness and have the eyewitness identify the man. And when they didn't do that, being a lawyer, it started really raising red flags with me, number one. Then number two, in regards to the man in orange who was taken into custody after we landed, uh, you see the government couldn't say he didn't exist because he was taken away from all, a group of all of us passengers and several other passengers saw this so they had to lie and cover up who he was. They couldn't say he didn't exist like they tried to do with the man in tan suit. So they started telling lies about this man. First of all, they said he didn't exist, and that didn't fly because several passengers saw him. It wasn't just me this time. Uh, you know, and then they, they told five other lies. After we had been there for about an hour, all the time with our carry-on bags, 
three bomb sniffing dogs were brought in. One of them sat down by the bag that was brought in by him. The man in orange, he had an orange, he appeared to be of Indian or Pakistani or some similar descent, maybe around age 30. He was walked back to a room, not in handcuffs. Uh, he went in the door, he was in there approximately an hour. When he came out, he was handcuffed, taken away. A, an FBI officer came up to the group of the rest of us passengers and said the following, which is not exact, but close. You're being moved to another area, it's not safe here. I'm sure all of you saw what just happened and can figure out why you're being moved. We were taken to a customs area and uh, they brought bomb dogs in, uh, checked all the luggage with that. Uh, another person was taken aside and handcuffed and brought out uh, and we were moved into another room for safety reasons, they told us. My story on this has been the same all along and uh, the FBI now has five versions of their story, which I clearly lay out with the time period and with each version, and they're just not, they're not credible. There is absolutely no excuse for the reason why, number one, we're left on the plane for 20 minutes, not knowing if there is another bomb there. Number two, security allowing us to take our carry-on bags off the plane, and we stood there with all of our bags together, for an hour until the bomb sniffing dogs arrived. Uh, and then, you know, after they found one, well, then we're moved to another area and now they don't want to talk about the man who was taken away. You were there, they didn't stop him for immigration violations. The dog went over and sat down in front of his bag, the alert right. for explosives. Right, exactly. Unless this is a passport sniffing dog. Uh, this is a huge story, one of the biggest out there. The FBI is on this full time. They know what's going on. Why are they being dishonest? And, and, and how do we investigate this when the investigators themselves are engaged in clear obstruction of the truth? You know, I don't know how else to take it. It's either utter incompetence or intentionally hiding something, you know, and I don't know how to take it. I came out to the media and I said, look, that's not possible. These were bomb sniffing dogs, not agricultural sniffing dogs. And this went on five times and then they finally quit talking about him and, and gave up. But they kept changing their story about him. You know, obviously it would be easier for them to say, like they did um, the man in Tansu, that he just didn't exist. But they couldn't do that because there were so many witnesses. So that's how they handled that man. But eventually they, did, they just gave up on even talking about him. Interestingly enough, at the end of January uh, 2010, when this case was about a month old, uh, well, a little earlier on, we had Obama come out and say, hey, this was just a series of mistakes that we made, and, you know, we need to beef up our security procedures or what have you. But then recently after that, uh, we had two important things at the end of January 2010. One was an ABC News article brought by Brian Ross, where he came out and said, yeah, you know, this uh, man in tan suit that was witnessed by passengers, he said passengers, but really it was just me, uh, that, you know, we're looking into this guy and we think he actually helped the underwear bomber so that he wouldn't get cold feet. Um, you know, they didn't uh, go so far as to admit what I had been saying that, uh, you know, that, that would have been impossible that he was Al-Qaeda because he went to the desk and said, we do this all the time. And then he had enough authority to walk down this hallway in a secure area and talk to the manager and get the man on the flight. So obviously Al-Qaeda couldn't do that. But they did admit the existence of the man in this article. So to me, that was a big story because it was not only the first time they admitted his existence, but they've never admitted his existence after that. But at least we have it once detailed, not only that, but it's by ABC News, so fairly credible uh, ma media, at least, you know, to some. Uh, but later in January 2010, we had hearings in Congress on this where we had Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy come out, and if you watch the video of him, it's pretty telling that he's trying to uh, cover up something and not tell the truth. He's squirming in his chair and seems really uncomfortable answering the questions. And this video is all over the internet if you want to Google it and look at it. But what he said is basically, you know, we knew Abdul Mutalab was a terrorist. We wanted to stop him from coming in the country and revoke his visa. 
there have been numerous cases where our unilateral and uncoordinated revocation of a visa would have disrupted important investigations that were underway by one of our national security partners. They had the individual under investigation, and our revocation action would have disclosed U.S. government's interest in that individual and ended our colleagues' ability, such as the FBI, to pursue the case quietly and to identify terrorist plans and co-conspirators. But we had a request from an intelligence agency, and he didn't say which one. What he said was, we'll talk about it in closed session. And he said, we had a request from an intelligence agency that they're tracking Abdul Mutalab. They, uh, they want to let him into the U.S. to follow him and to catch bigger fish. And they honor that request in order to let whatever intelligence agency do their business so that they wouldn't knock out one lone soldier in the war on terror and they could essentially follow him in the U.S. and catch accomplices. So that's what they admitted to. But Patrick Kennedy went on to say, there's more to this we need to talk about in closed session, and that's kind of where it ended. So uh, obviously, I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, what uh, I believe through and what's been shown through the evidence, I believe, is that an intelligence agency gave Abdul Mutalab an intentionally defective bomb and put him on the plane to stage a fake terrorist attack. So though, you know, those two things early on raised a lot of red flags with me, and then because of that, I just started paying attention to every single detail in this case, going to all the court hearings, and it's just been one contradiction after another after another, one lie after another after another, you know, the media not wanting to report on things, and it's just, to me, it's a very, very obvious staged event. And that was our exclusive interview with Kurt Haskell, a uh, witness and uh, outspoken critic of the entire fraudulent underwear bomber case, another false flag set up to enslave us and force us through body scanners, shut down our travel. But that was only part two. We have another part coming up. Of course, it'll all be up for our great Prison Planet subscribers later. Uh, but now, of course, we turn to our quote of the day. Coming up after the break is, of course, none other than Sheriff Richard Mack. It's going to be a great interview. Uh, such a great guy, a constitutionalist, can't go wrong. He's going to run uh, actually in Congress against some of these unconstitutional uh, monsters who've been in office for decades, vote for NDAA, internet control bills, everything. Anyway, our quote is from Arnold J. Toynbee. Uh, there's another Arnold Toynbee as well, the elder. Uh, this Toynbee was 1889 to 1975 lifespan. He was actually the first president of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the, brand, the public branch off that is the sister organization to the Council on Foreign Relations, all coming from the Rhodes, uh, Cecil Rhodes Secret Society that steers so much of our modern day, all based on that Jesuit model of secret societies, based on that Illuminati model of secret societies, always working in secret. And here's that quote from Professor Arnold Toynbee, best known for his 12-volume series, A Study of History. We are presently working discreetly with all our might to wrest this mysterious force called sovereignty out of the clutches of the local nation states of the world. That's right, they want to destroy sovereignty. That quote's from 1931. You've heard, you've heard the other quotes, the founding quote of the CFR, about how they want to undermine, circumvent, destroy national sovereignty, and all the other players that are part of the system. Bilderberg, again, is a branch from the Cecil Rhodes Secret Society. And um, it's just crazy, crazy what these people are involved in. We're going to continue to expose them and stop them because we have no other choice. This is our future. This is our lives. This is our right. We have a right to the life, to our lives, to our pursuit of happiness. And uh, that's just the way it is. We're never going to stop. Uh, we'll be back after this break. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Of course, Alex will be speaking this Sunday at the High Lie in Orlando, Florida. It's sold out, but uh, you'll be able to see it later on the web if you're not able to attend, as well as the speaking engagement last week in Dallas, Texas. So thanks for watching, and we'll be back with Sheriff Richard Mack.
America is in trouble. Washington is a disgrace. Government has become too big. It's overtaxing, overspending. We need to change direction. We really need change. We can't afford to make the same mistakes we've made in the past. Mitt Romney's reputation as a flip-flopper. He went the other way when he got paid to go the other way. There is need for economic stimulus. It's about serial hypocrisy. This election is about trust. There's been one true consistent candidate, and that's Dr. Ron Paul. Ron Paul has been so consistent from the very beginning. He seems like a more honest candidate. He tells the truth about what he believes, whether you like it or not. He's never once voted for a tax increase, never once voted for an unbalanced budget. Ron Paul's plan is bold, cuts five departments. It's what we need. When he says he's going to cut a trillion dollars in the first year, I believe it. If you don't like how things are going and you're tired of politicians, he's something different. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Is the one we've been looking for. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. Now, we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick, and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at InfoWars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at InfoWars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. InfoWars.com forward slash events. And we're back from break. We're joined now by a guest who really needs no introduction for our audience, but he is the former sheriff of Graham County, Arizona, and uh, you know him better as Sheriff Richard Mack. Thanks for joining us, sir. Hey, Eric. Good to see you again. Yeah, so no Alex, huh? Well, Alex is on the road. Uh, he just spoke in Dallas last Sunday, and then he's going to be speaking in Orlando this Sunday. Well, I'm glad he's keeping busy. Mm -hmm. You know, good yeah, job. Yeah, he's reaching out, and we're trying to make this I would, awakening I, I, happen. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be shocked if he's busier than I am. Yes, but, sir. Uh, <laughs> but I'm glad he's busy. So. Well, tell us what all you're up to, because it's quite a well, bit. Well, as, as you know, we just uh, completed our first uh, Constitutional Sheriff Convention in Las Vegas, and uh, that was January 30th, and and I'm I'm going to tell you, it was just an absolute uh, resounding success. Uh, it couldn't have been better. Um, I, I think I guess the only way it could have been better is if instead of having 90 sheriffs, that we would have had 150 mm -hmm. or, or 200. Um, we we did a grassroots effort to uh, raise the money for this event. We we paid for all the sheriffs. Uh, travel expenses. We paid for the hotel. We paid for the food, uh, and the people all across America made that happen for us. Uh, and now, absolutely, uh, we want to have another one, and we're we're planning to have another one. And uh, it, what this convention did for all of us, including the sheriffs that were there, it it proved this works. Yeah. It it absolutely proved that what we're doing is legitimate. And, I mean, here we have the Denver Post article about it. And what is the headline? Emerging movement encourages sheriffs to act as a shield against federal tyranny. Uh, and people want to call that crazy or radical. Couldn't There's, be more constitutional. It's absolutely constitutional. It's American, for God's sakes. Who? Nobody? Nobody should do anything about tyranny. Just let the federal government do whatever they're going to do. Right now... We have the EPA shutting down land, uh, and this was part of our uh, presentation. The Sackett family in Idaho was fined $32,500 a day, and you know why? Because they were 
making a foundation to build a home on their own property. Building a home on their own property. Yeah. And now we have uh, Amish farmers in Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania, Maryland, and where I just came back from, Wisconsin. Uh, and, and I was talking to one sheriff about it and another reporter. He says, well, one of those guys you were talking about, uh, you called Amish. He, he's not Amish anymore. And I said, well, his fundamental beliefs are, but I don't care if he's atheist. Right. You know, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. The thing that I, I like to bring up about that some of them are Amish that they're going after, and indeed the FDA was going after uh, David Hostetler in uh, Indiana because he wouldn't uh, uh, pasteurize his milk. I, I find it so astonishingly hypocritical and corrupt that our country, our government, brags, we don't arrest you anymore for failing to get to the back of the bus. We don't arrest you anymore uh, for not giving your seat to a white man. Oh, yeah, but we will arrest you for not pasteurizing your milk. You know, and again, I don't care what religion any American is. Uh, I don't care uh, what your personal beliefs are. In America, we don't do that. And that you don't get the proper license. But the, the, prop, the problem with the, part of this is, is that uh, one of the Amish farmers had allowed the FDA to come on his property and do an inspection several times. And he passed the inspection with flying colors. You know, we've got this here just to bring up as a bypass. The queen has been caught <laughs> loving raw milk, but she won't Yay. let Canadians drink it. We're not supposed to drink it here. I've been drinking raw milk. I think it's really good for you. It's got all the it, amino acids in there. and uh, It is really good for you. And the thing of it is, I flew out to Madison, Wisconsin, to drink milk with, with Max Kane and Vernon Hirschberger. Mm -hmm. And um, Max Kane is not Amish, but Vernon Hirschberger grew up Amish. And, and he's left some of the Amish traditions. Like he will drive a car and he does have a computer and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But his fundamental beliefs are still Amish. And uh, he has a wonderful family, and I went to his farm. Uh, but, but as I said, I went all the way out from Arizona, and I live in Texas now, as you know. But this was a year and a half ago when I still lived in Arizona. Flew all the way out, did, had never met Vernon Hershberger or Max Kane, went to the state capitol steps and drank illegal uh, contraband. We've got it on screen right now. There it is. There's, there I am, drinking milk with Vernon Hershberger and Max Kane and uh, breaking the law on the state capitol steps. And I went all the way from Arizona to Wisconsin to drink raw milk. And you know what? I hate milk. Yeah. I don't even like milk. Never have. This is the first time my children, who are all adults, my oldest is 36, and this is the first time ever my kids have seen me drink a glass of milk. Yeah. But I will tell you, you are correct. Uh, raw milk tastes better than store-bought milk, than pasteurized milk. Oh, there's and no question. And it's 10 times better for you. Yeah. You know, and so, but of course, the FDA now wants to shut them down. And, and actually, the one in Wisconsin is the state government. The state government is now trying to put Vernon Hershberger in jail because he will not pasteurize his milk. This is a farm that's been in their family for a long time. And all this is, is they feed cows grass. That's it. Grass. Yeah. Only grass. Very that's dangerous. it. Very dangerous. Not corn. Oh, yeah, I know. And then they take the milk and put it in some containers right from the cows, and they provide it to some of their friends and family members and neighbors, you know, friends and neighbors. And... We want to put him in jail for that. But that's why we had to bring back the conversation about the Constitution, because it's Alice in Wonderland otherwise. I mean, it what is. do you think about the whole GMO issue? They're doing it all is. this lab-made lab food, so-called, and they right. won't even label it, and they're fast-tracking that stuff, but they're shutting yeah. down organic food conventions in Nevada, because it, it's, it's not an isolated case with the Amish. It's lemonade it's stands. It's everything. It, lemonade stands, exactly. Uh, you know, the seven-year-old girl in California got a... Uh, arrested or something, or charged or fined, ticketed by cops because uh, she wasn't licensed to do lemonade. And and I'm going to tell you right now, every chance I get, I drink uh, raw milk and and use raw cheese and and other uh, raw dairy products. 
And when I was out in Wisconsin, just I'm just talking two weeks ago, I was out there on the Hirschberger farm, mm -hmm. and I had an entire meal uh, twice w with products just from his farm. Everything right from his farm. Organic, his family, all his children help with the processing of the farm, work on the farm. I've never seen more well-adjusted children, happier children, healthier children, a good American family. Yeah. And what are they getting? Threats from our government to go to jail. And we're going to destroy their farm. We're going to destroy their land. We're going to destroy their family as much as we possibly can. And quite frankly, a lot of what my book is about is that very issue, the magic of gun control. It sounds like I'm only talking about gun control, but quite frankly, I'm talking about all the abuses going on. There's magic in our government. Only our government can keep us safe. Exactly. Only gun control can keep us safe. And world history has taught us that all that is a big farce. So you have to believe, if you're going to believe today's politicians, you have to believe that there's magic. Yeah. You know? And, and quite frankly, the book points out, I, bring a, I, I invented a new word for the book, polymagician. Yeah. And a polymagician is, of course, an illusionist and a politician put together. So polymagician. So you, you got to go to sheriffmac.com to get the book. An illusionist for the many or the masses. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it talks about the food freedom, and everybody should be just simply saying, "Let's live and let live in this country." I don't know why our government doesn't go by that one simple rule. Live and let live. If I'm not hurting anybody else, and of course these Amish farmers would never hurt anybody. They're, they're completely the most peaceful people on the face of the planet. Good, honest American people. And of course, what does our government do? Our government hasn't got one simple thing straight for a long time. Leave people alone. Government has to leave me alone unless I'm hurting someone else. Which... Brings us to, when I say polymagician, I naturally think of Lamar Smith. <laughs> and there's going to be an interesting race there. Why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> well, I, I'm, uh, now I moved, I moved to Texas not even quite a year ago. Mm -hmm. And as I told Alex before on our last show, I didn't move to Texas to run for anything. I just wanted to move to Texas to concentrate on the constitutional sheriff movement. Right. And as the Denver Post pointed out, it is a movement. It's an emerging movement. And it is. And it is a successful one. And it is a powerful one. And one of the sheriffs from Oregon said that some of the sheriffs out in the West uh, and, and in Oregon told him not to attend because the, our convention was going to be too radical. And this sheriff came up and told, uh, shook my hand and said, hey, you know, I was told not to come to this because it was too radical. And he, he said... Yeah. There's nothing radical here. This is just America. Yeah, the Denver you Post, know? it wasn't really a bad article, but they kind of no. made it sound like, oh, it's scary that citizens are asking their sheriffs to attend this event and, and telling them they're not going to vote for them if they don't want to be constitutional. Oh, man, you don't want to do that. Right. You see, a constituent doesn't have the right to do that. And we've got yeah. some of the photos on the screen, by the way. <laughs> now, that's uh, Peggy Littleton and uh, her county sheriff. Uh, Peggy Littleton is a county commissioner from Colorado. Mm -hmm. Sheriff Makita is standing there next to her, and he's her county sheriff. They are working together to um, uh, oppose and nullify the NDAA, actually trying to protect their citizens in tandem, which in my book I say, there's an equation in my book, a constitutional county commissioner plus a constitutional sheriff equals liberty. And that's exactly, that's all we're talking about. And let, let's make a, a point very clear here. Uh, I have never advocated violence against the federal government. Of course. And I will never. And it, now I'm suing the Southern Poverty Law Center, as you're very much aware. Right. Because they said I did. And that has ca caused a great deal of damage towards me and what I'm trying to do. Because... All their publications get out all over the country to law enforcement agencies. And in fact, Time Magazine even said that I said that, and I guess they were quoting the Southern Poverty Law Center. 
Well, I'm I'm plain and simply uh, not going to put up with it anymore. The Southern Poverty Law Center is such a dishonest organization, and they've lied about me since 1994. When when all of a sudden I'm so shocked that I'm in these books about from uh, Morris Dees and the Southern Poverty Law Center that I'm some horrible threat and terrorist. And do you know all that I did to gain that uh, uh, honor? You didn't believe in the magic. I did, I did not believe in the magic. And, uh, all I did was file a lawsuit against the Clinton administration to stop the Brady Bill because the uh, federal government wanted to force me into uh, compliance and to go along with their idiotic, stupid mandates to, to comply with the Brady Bill. And I just simply said, the federal government can't tell me what to do. Is yeah. that so hard? Is that so wrong? That makes me a terrorist because I don't want to go off along with the Clinton administration and this ridiculous violation of the Constitution known as the Brady Bill. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court and you beat him. And I beat him. Yeah. And so Lamar Smith better know you're a fighter and people yeah. know about his tyranny. People are waking yeah. up and it's those kind of people in Congress whose time have come, I think. Yeah, and, and you know, quite frankly, let's look at all the things that Lamar Smith has done. He voted for the Patriot Act. He voted for the NDAA. He believe, in fact, as a Republican, he has given the ultimate power to the worst president in American history, to Barack Obama, and has taken us full circle. That's exactly what King George III was doing. Yeah. So we've come full circle, and who gave Barack Obama now the power to use military against American citizens without any recourse, no habeas corpus, no bill of rights, no nothing, no trials, no, no uh, uh, charges even filed against people. They can just say, you're, you're an enemy combatant, you're a terrorist, we're putting you away. And so this is what Lamar Smith has done. And now he wants to come back to District 21 in Texas, which is between Austin and San Antonio and all the counties in between. He wants to come back and say, what a hero I am, you know? Uh, yeah, I believe in all these spendings. And I believe in SOPA, SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act. He wants now to have the federal government regulate the Internet and you know why they want to do that. They want to tax it to death and tax it out of existence, but they can't balance the budget. This is another thing Congress has failed at. They've now gone over a thousand days without establishing a budget, so they've broken the law there, haven't done their job. And isn't it amazing? You remember Martha Stewart, why she went to prison? Insider trading. I Insider think. trading. She must have been really bad. Oh my gosh, went to prison for six months. And yet now, the newspapers report that Lamar Smith has done the exact same thing. In fact, even worse, he actually worked on a committee in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. to get a company, a private company, a contract with the federal government. A few days before that was official, he invested in that company. And I wouldn't say any, I didn't make any of this up. I just read the newspapers, just right. like anybody else can do. And so they, the newspaper asked him about that, and he said, well, my broker did it. It was just a coincidence. All five times. Mm. Five times he invested in that same company. Now he's making thousands using his position, my dear friends, using his position to make money off the backs of these kinds of deals. Well, insider trading. Insider trading. Doesn't that come closer to racketeering? Or? It, it is. It is. It should be illegal. And uh, they even suggested that they should make it illegal. And, of course, Lamar Smith opposed that. This is what happens when we have career politicians. This is what happens when people stay in Washington, D.C. too long. Yeah. And I will not do that. First of all, my record speaks for itself. I will follow the Constitution, and anybody wants to help out with this campaign, we really need your help. Just go to, and this is a great one. I love this line, SheriffMacForCongress.com. You know, and, and I love telling uh, Lamar Smith, hey, I'm coming to Washington. There's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> and so, the tagline's ready to go. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and I feel like saying, Mr. Smith, instead of going to what Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Mr. Smith, get out of Washington, and I'm a go candidate. Uh, goes home from Washington. Get out of our house. Yeah. Yeah, get out of our house. Well, he's not the only one. There's a lot of people who need to leave Washington. Well, and go is trying to go after a lot of them. And I'm glad you said that because, yeah, we need to get rid of all the incumbents. I have a bumper sticker that says, uh, reelect no one. And that's really how I feel. And I'm here to tell you and everybody else, um, I will not stay over eight years. That's it. Right. Eight years was good enough for George Washington. 
It should be good enough for Lamar Smith and, and everybody else. And the founding fathers never intended that uh, we'd have career politicians uh, destroying our country. And, and, and I do mean that. Now, James Madison, in my book, I quote Madison, and he says that the American people will lose more freedom by the, from those in power than by any sudden war or attack by, from a foreign enemy. This is where we're at today. Our own government and our own leaders destroying our Constitution, trampling the principles of freedom that our country was founded upon. Why don't we hold them accountable for this? You know, I, and quite frankly, it's not a political thing, it's not a Democrat thing, it's not a Republican thing. We've got to stand on principle in this country. We've got to stand for the Constitution. If we're not gonna do that, then what makes us any better than anybody else that's in jail? Yeah. And Sheriff, let's talk more about the NDAA, because I know you've studied mm -hmm. history. You know about Soviet Russia and China and mm -hmm. the Stasi in East Germany. And, and isn't Homeland Security and the NDAA moving us all dangerously close to those trends? It's just classical tyranny, and they think they're going to bring that down on this country. And I don't know if people are talking enough about NDAA, but we've got states saying no, passing bills saying they're not going to go along with it. Right. You've already talked about the people at the county level. Right. Um, let's talk some more about that. Well, it, it was a big part of our Constitutional Sheriff Convention. The NDA came up frequently, and that our, our federal government could be so blatant and open about such a horrible uh, violation of the Constitution. There, this is basically our own government declaring war on our, our own Bill of Rights, declaring war on freedom and liberty. Yeah. And it all falls in. I mean, you're talking about GMOs. I mean, all the corn in this country right now is GMO. Yeah. You know, it, ge genetically modified corn, all of it. And, and I've even had farmers who don't even, who aren't really too concerned about that. He says, oh yeah, Monsanto own, owns all our corn and all our farms and they tell us how to do this GMO corn and that's what we do. So Agenda 21 was another big thing that we talked about at our convention. And, and I have to tell you too though, the entire convention started with a film that I put together that simply showed all the abuses going on in America. Mm -hmm. Then we went right into Michael Badnerik's uh, one hour review of the Bill of Rights. And then I did a half hour deal on my Supreme Court case that you were just talking about and how that restores the 10th Amendment and state sovereignty. And so right after that, we went to a break and I had a sheriff from Texas come up to me and uh, he said, Sheriff, uh, I've got to tell you something. I was really wondering about coming to this convention. And he, he put his hands up to his, to his face and goes like this, you got me. And you know, I was so thrilled with that. And I said, you know what? The spirit of freedom was so strong in that room, you could cut it with a knife. And it was obvious that this sheriff felt it he knew what he was talking about. He knew what he had felt. And he, here he comes now with a complete, almost like a, like a testimonial, saying, you got me. It worked. Whatever you had here. And we'd only been into the conference two and a half hours. This thing went all day. It started at 7.30 in the morning and went till 9.30 at night. Now, could people not in law enforcement see these films too? Because this sounds like a good resource. Yes, yes, you can. And you can get all this at uh, the countysheriffproject.org. Mm -hmm. or go to SheriffMac.com. And again, SheriffMac.com is where you can get the new book, The Magic of Gun Control. But really, and, and anybody who would like to help with the campaign, uh, if you want to see me uh, get this, uh, uh, what would you call him, a rhino Republican or uh, unconstitutional congressman out of office, um, it, the guy who helped get the NDAA in, and Mr. Lamar Sopa Smith, that's what we call him now, Lamar Sopa Smith, who wants the federal government to regulate the internet. If any of you are in favor of that and you want the uh, federal government to force companies to, just like yours here even, to keep track of all your clients and customers and to keep a, a list for the FBI to come check anytime they want. That's what they wanna do. And they wanna chill yeah. free speech too. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and so if, if you wanna stop all that, help me out at SheriffMacForCongress.com. SheriffMacForCongress.com. And we'll take back America again. I'd still believe more than anything, as I've said here on this program before, that the best way to take America back is county by county, state by state, sheriff by sheriff, county commissioners working together with sheriffs to defend the United States Constitution and, and my personal and your personal 
God-given rights. But this is all about the Tenth Amendment. Uh, governments always go mm -hmm. out of control, and it's always because of centralized power. Right. That's why the founders wanted as many checks and balances at every level as they could. And that's what you're doing here. You started with 90 sheriffs out of, what, 3,000? Correct. Isn't that close to 3%? Isn't that what we had in uh, yep. the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War? War? Yeah. So I'd say that's a good start. But I'll tell you, this is going to expand. And a lot the sheriffs who were there, uh, as you can see, the quotes from the sheriffs in, De in Denver and Colorado, uh, they really liked it. And, of course, you know, there's a sheriff saying, uh, I don't want, obviously, I don't want violence against other law enforcement uh, offices. Well, we don't either. Obviously. But do you, know, do you want to guarantee that not happening? Do you want to guarantee anybody here listening to the program, anybody uh, at Infowars.com, do you want to guarantee that that won't happen? Then get your sheriff involved in the process, and I'll guarantee that we'll keep this peaceful. Right. Okay? That'll make it happen. And we had 90 sheriffs who are witnesses now that we are not asking for violence. We are trying to find a way to prevent it. And, in fact, you want to go through history? Uh, Rosa Parks was arrested by people who had badges on. Rosa Parks should have been taken home by those two officers, mm -hmm. not to jail. Right. Oh, you mean don't enforce the law? That's exactly what I mean. When the law becomes destructive of freedom and liberty, we got to have sheriffs and peace officers and deputies and county commissioners who stand against stupid laws. That's what I'm about. And now tell me which one is more correct. <laughs> Which one keeps the peace? Protecting Rosa Parks and escorting her home or sending her to jail? Well, that's what they want to do with us today. Our government has never stopped putting people at the back of the bus. They just go from one group to another. Gun owners, I'm afraid, are going to be next on the Obama agenda. If Obama gets elected, uh, you better grab your guns and your Bible because he's coming after them. And, and my book, The Magic of Gun Control, definitely bears that out. Uh, the, the whole entire Fast and Furious thing, yeah. that's all it was about, was more gun control. It was not about sending guns to Mexico. It was about gun control. They wanted to create such an uproar to, to show that these guns are coming from Arizona gun shops and Arizona gun shows down to the cartels. The federal government staged that whole thing so that we could get more gun control going in America. It blew up in their face because Agent John Dodson uh, whistle blew on them, and here we go again, and of course, Agent Brian Terry loses his life in this thing. This was an operation called Fast and Furious. Folks, you help me get to Washington, D.C., I'll show you Fast and Furious. We'll cut so many departments, including the BATF, your head will spin. You want Fast and Furious in Washington, D.C.? Sheriff Mack for Congress. Well, I like what you have to say about the magic quip because they just want us to transfer <laughs> all the power behind the Wizard of Oz's curtain. Exactly. And, and just hey, I like that. Him, you right? got I mean. it. Yeah, you got it, Aaron. That's exactly right. This exposes the men behind the curtain. I mean, who do they think we are? Who do we think they are? <laughs> we know what they're doing up there. Yeah, very good. I like that. So, yeah, we do have to put a balance of power back, and obviously it does start at the county and state level. So. Well, my case says that. I'm glad you brought balance of power because uh, Justice Scalia in our Supreme Court victory he actually said that the solution to all of this is simply maintaining a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government. Yeah. So that's all we're after. We're not after hurting anybody or destroying anybody. Yeah, we want, we want government off our backs. We want the federal government to be responsible, and we want to cut the federal bureaucracies. That's it. Now, the federal government has already proved they won't do that. So what's the, what's the only answer left? State sovereignty. The states have to do it. And so uh, there's nothing, again, there's nothing radical. There's nothing subversive about it. There's nothing illegal, unlawful, or violent. Uh, this is an effective means exercising uh, a peaceful solution to a horrible problem that the federal government has caused once again. There's a big shocker. Unlawful. Yeah. These people run mm -hmm. with a gang of criminals who've said they want to do an end run around the Constitution. That's not unlawful. Well, yeah, and Nancy Pelosi has said it, and, all, and many other congressmen have said, uh, and including Lamar Smith, saying, oh, it's, well, the Constitution's just, uh, 
uh, up for personal interpretation or it's a you know it's a guidelines but there's nothing express in it you know and mm. it's a living document and you know basically congress can still do whatever it wants nothing expressed yeah. with enumerated powers and enumerated guaranteed powers. explicit yeah. rights and yeah and and even scalia says that word in my decision he said that the 10th amendment and the enumerated enumeration of powers the discrete and enumerated powers granted to the federal government are rendered express by the Tenth Amendment. So it is express, uh, expressly uh, forbidden that the federal government go outside Article One, Section Eight. That's this, what they ought to call our movement: Article One, Section Eight. And people, this guy knows about the Constitution. Obviously, people like Lamar Smith do not. Yeah. How do we help you in the campaign? Uh, when is the election? What are the things people need to know about that? Well, they keep moving the primary, which is totally helping me because of this uh, ridiculous thing going on with the redistricting here in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually helping me. It was going to be March 3rd, which I didn't have enough time because I barely got into this. Right. But now they've moved it back to the last part of April and maybe even May or June. It could even go into August if the fighting between the Democrats and Republicans continue on the redistricting issue. That's all helping me. It's playing into my hands. And so, folks, if you can, make a donation or whatever you can at SheriffMacForCongress.com. SheriffMacForCongress.com. We need volunteers. Again, anybody who would like to help, just get a hold of us at uh, SheriffMac at Hotmail.com. Or you, you can email. There's an email also available at SheriffMacForCongress.com. Dot com. I love that uh, Back Mac uh, bumper sticker, Back Mac. You know? Back Mac, yeah. Yeah, Back Mac. Return yeah. of the Mac. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think it'd be great, too, to force a debate on topics like the NDAA, the SOPA bills, all this stuff. They need to speak out about the stuff they're voting Lamar for. Lamar Smith won't debate me. Yeah. Yeah, you guys ought to call him and say, we want to have a debate with you and Sheriff Mac. That would be interesting, says. yeah. Yeah, well, call him. Say, all yeah. right. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, and hey. uh, we're supporting you over here. Thanks so, a lot, Aaron. Appreciate yeah. you, brother. You too. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good to have you. And that's it for the nightly news. We'll, of course, be back tomorrow. Alex, again, speaking this Sunday in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I don't even know if tickets are still available. I'm sure they'll tell me in there. But check it out. Show up anyway and uh, help support this broadcast if you can. We depend on subscribers. Uh, we'll talk to you later.